Good morning, Riverview. I'm so glad that you're here to join us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Wendy, and I do women's ministry around Riv. Um, and I'm just grateful to be here with you today. If you are new, um, you can fill out this connect portion of your tear or your handout and tear that off and put it in the red buckets when they come by later and just tell us a little bit about yourself. And also, if you are used to being around Riv, but you need some information or you have a prayer request or something like that, you can go ahead and fill those out too. Um, and someone will be in touch with you this week. So two of our core values here at Riverview are that we are gospel focused and motivated, which means that um, we care greatly about the gospel. And it kind of is a filter that we use for all of the things that we do. Um, the things that we do, we want to share the gospel through them, and we want to know the gospel. And then uh, another core value that we have is to be in community together, but also in the community. And these two core values kind of come together every summer for Vacation Bible School. How many of you attended a VBS when you were a kid? Yeah, so much fun, right? They're the highlight of the summer. Um, so we will be having Vacation Bible School at each one of our venues this summer, July 8th through the 12th, and it's going to be at from 6 to 6 or 6 to 8:30 every evening for that week. And we are doing them at all three locations so that we can share the gospel to these children in their own communities. Um, which is great about having three venues because we can be in the community. You can easily invite your friends. It's going to be a party. The theme is like this disco party, so it's going to be super fun. So if you are interested in that and have kiddos that want to come, you can go to rivchurch.com slash VBS and you can sign up your kiddos there. Or if you are like, I want to go serve and I want to hang out with these kids and party with them, go to rivchurch.com. Um, slash VBS, and you can sign up to serve there because we will need lots of help. Um, so yeah. Now I'm going to hand it on over to my friend Rachel, and she's going to lead us in worship. Hey guys, so my band name that I've been given is Rachel and Friends. Today it's just me. No friends. I'll be honest, though, I do often feel a little bit sad when it is just me, um, but something that I really do appreciate about worship through music is the fact that we get to worship in so many different ways, whether that be with a super loud rock band or if it's just one person. And when we do have the opportunity to just have one person, we really do get to hear each other a lot better and speak truths over each other in that way. Um, so while we're worshiping today, if you can just um, really pay attention to the people around you and listen to the voices that are filling the room and think about the fact that you really are singing truths over each other and also over me as I'm up here today, just me and the keys and the Lord. So would you guys please stand and sing with me? Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Show. Sure. 
Would you guys pray with me? Lord, um, thank you for the gift of worship and the many ways that we are able to come to you in worship, Lord. Um, thank you that we have the freedom to gather here in your name. Um, help us to be present during today's teaching, Lord. Um, and I pray over Noel as he comes up here, Lord, and leads us in your word today, um, that you would just guide his words and open our hearts to hear what you have for us today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Verge students, thank you so much for worshiping with us. You guys can go ahead and head to your classroom. And we're just going to continue in worship. So I'm going to call um, the welcome team forward with their red buckets. And um, just want to thank you guys so much for um, being good stewards and um, giving your gifts. So if you have a gift today, you can put it in the red buckets. Um, there are lots of other different opportunities that you can um, share your gifts. If you have one of those tear-offs, you can put it in there. Um, and your gifts just make things like VBS possible. Um, and I forgot to mention for VBS that it is ages three through sixth grade. So I'm just throwing that out there now. But we are grateful um, for your gifts to RIV so that we can do all of the things that we do here. And now we're going to um, have Ian. Hang on a minute. I'm going to go get the TV. <laughs> And then we'll watch Ian read um, the scripture to us. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one, corrupted no one, taken advantage of no one. I don't say this to condemn you, since I have already said that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm very frank with you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I'm overflowing with joy in all of our afflictions. In fact, when we came to Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were troubled in every way. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the arrival of Titus. And not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorrow and your zeal for me so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. And if I regretted it, since I saw that the letter grieved you, yet only for a while, I now rejoice. 
not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. So most of us will do almost anything to avoid pain, won't we? <laughs> like, well, except for gym bros. Those guys, it's all pain, you know, no pain, no gain, right? As they're throwing around the weights and drinking the powder, protein powder. But the rest of us, we, we will do almost anything to avoid pain. Well, except for college students, right? They go through the pain of college and then studying for um, MCATs and LSATs and all the other ATs out there. So they can eventually have a career, make some money. They'll go through that pain. But there's, so there's some pain in our lives that we are willing to face, but there's one kind of pain that nobody ever signs up for, and that is the pain of grief. Grief is a sort of pain that is an unwanted guest that intrudes into our lives, and grief disrupts everything, it changes everything forever, and so no one wants grief, and it's, it's hard to see that there is any silver lining when it comes to grief. And yet, the passage that we're looking at today that we just heard Ian read tells us that there is a type of grief that God wants for you. Let me say that again to make sure you get it. There is a type of grief that God wants for you. We've been working our way through the book of 2 Corinthians for the past four months. And there is this sense in which uh, the Apostle Paul who wrote 2 Corinthians is really like a broken record. And, and he talks all the time about um, this, the, he, he talks about defending his ministry um, from some accusations that had come this way. He talks about suffering and affliction over and over. And so this week what he talks about is affliction and defending his ministry. It's like the same thing he's been saying over and over. But in this passage, he also takes an unexpected expected twist. And so I want to look at that twist today, starting in verse 4, where the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, I am very frank with you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overflowing with joy in all of our afflictions. So what Paul is saying here is he's like, okay, let's be real for a second. He's like, I'm facing afflictions but there is something that is happening in these afflictions which is causing me to overflow with joy. And there's something that you have done, Corinthians, that, that has caused this overflowing of joy in the midst of afflictions in my life. And so Paul is referring to this thing that not only had overflowing joy in his life, but it also caused him great pride in the Corinthians and it caused him great encouragement. So what is the thing that in the middle of afflictions could cause overflowing of joy, it could cause pride, and it could cause encouragement? Well, it was grief. And, and even stranger, it was grief that Paul caused the Corinthians. It, 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 it seems so strange. Look at this, verse 8. He says, for even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. And if I did regret it, <laughs> in other words, well, I sort of regret it. <laughs> I didn't regret it, but I sort of regretted it. He said, since I saw that the letter grieved you, yet only for a while. What is, what's going on here? Well, we've been in this letter long enough that it might be important to take a step back and remember why he wrote this whole thing, right? So let me just give you a recap, and if you, this is your first week, it's a, it's a good week to be here. So what happened was, in around the year 50 AD, this guy Paul, who's writing this letter, started this church. He planted this church in a, this bustling metropolis of Corinth. The Corinth was a, a very important cultural city. It was very multi-ethnic. It, it had a lot of commerce because of where it was located, and it had a lot of different religious beliefs in their city. And so it was kind of a wild 
town kind of like Tokyo meets New York meets Las Vegas meets Hollywood, kind of all wrapped up into one in the city there. And, and so he started this church in Corinth, and then a couple of years later, he moved on and went to start another work in a city called Ephesus, and he started writing letters back and forth to the Corinthians. And some of these letters got pretty difficult. And so Paul visits in 55-ish AD, and that visit does not go well. And so after that visit, he writes them a letter that he refers to as severe. So both the visit and the letter were, were difficult. And there were some people that were kind of gunning at Paul and sinning against him. In fact, there was one particular dude who had been doing that and it kind of comes up in these letters and he was causing division. He was trying to take down his ministry. So there was all kinds of rough stuff. By the way, there are some people who believe there, that if we had a perfect world with a perfect ministry and a perfect church, there'd be no conflict, and that is so untrue, by the way. <laughs> Paul was in conflict all of the time. Conflict happens. And so Paul here sends this letter. He's sending these letters back and forth, and he ends up sending a letter with a guy named Titus, who is young, one of his young protégés. And, and by the way, that's another side note. The apostle Paul did almost nothing without dragging some young leaders with him, and he would give them important tasks to do, not just busy work. And so Paul sends Titus with this letter, and, and then from the city Philippi, because he'd moved from Corinth to Ephesus to Philippi, and then Titus came back and reported on how they took the severe letter. <laughs> and that's where we are today. So Titus has returned. He's back to Paul. He, he, he's delivered this tough letter and it had grieved the Corinthians. Paul's letter was an unwanted guest in their life. <laughs> Paul's letter was disruptive and it changed everything for them. And Paul says, not only do I not regret writing that letter, but now that I've heard that you responded with grief, I'm encouraged. <laughs> I am joyful. I'm overflowing with joy when I heard of your grief. That's weird, isn't it? But the last two verses of this passage actually tell us why. And so I want to focus most of our time on that. This is what he says in verses 9 and 10. He says, I now rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God wills. In other words, there's a type of, of grief that God wants for you. For you are grieved as God wills so that you didn't experience any loss from us for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. So Paul says, uh, you were grieved as God wills. Wills. There's a sort of grief that God wants you to face, and it's one of the most profound concepts that you can see threaded through 2 Corinthians, and it's one that I see all the time with people. So here's what happens. We will sin. We'll do something, and maybe we know that this is a sin, and maybe we don't know that it's a sin, but we, we sin. And let's clearly define what sin is for a second so we, we know what cards we're playing with. Sin is any failure to reflect the image of God in our nature, attitude, or action. It's any time we are fundamentally unlike God or we are out of sync with how God created this universe to be. So let's say somebody commits adultery, which is uh, sleeping with someone who's not your spouse. The Bible doesn't say that's just a mistake. The Bible uses the word sin. That's a sin. When you cheat on your taxes... It's not just a way to make some extra money, it's a sin. When you steal from your workplace, it's not just a, well, they won't miss the staples, it's a sin. When, when you are disobedient to your parents, it's not just because your parents don't know anything, it's a sin. The Bible uses the word sin to define any time we are out of sync with how God created this world. What happens is sometimes we sin and we're just oblivious or we sin and nothing happens with our sin, but then sometimes with our sin, we are either convicted or confronted about our sin. And I have so many examples I could use. 
I, I, I began kind of whiteboarding this out, and then I realized I didn't want to throw anybody here under the bus. I didn't want you to sit out there and have me tell everyone about your sin. So I've decided to use the chief of all sinners in our church as my example, me. I want to give you two examples from my life. I grew up uh, in, out in the country, right between DeWitt and St. John's, and I went to a small rural elementary school. And when I was in junior high, my friend Charlie, we, uh, he transitioned from Charlie to Chaz somewhere in there, so I may say Charlie, I may say Chaz. He was one of my childhood friends. He and I would, every summer, we would, we would just, just hang out outside all day long, and we would ride motocross bikes and BMX bikes, and we had three-wheelers. Does anybody remember three-wheelers? They're like a quad with three wheels. They're illegal now uh, because they tip over so much, but they were great. Um, so we rode the three-wheeler all the time, and one day, when we were in junior high, we went out to the elementary school to play and, and to just rip around and, and cause mayhem, and they were doing some construction on the school while we were there, which meant there was a lot of stuff that we could play on, and so we had our skateboards with us, and we were just jumping off of all the construction stuff, and at one point, I'm jumping off the construction stuff with my skateboard, trying to do some kind of trick. And, and anyone who knows me knows if I try something athletic, I break something, usually a bone, but this time it was a window. Because as I jumped down with my skateboard, it shot out from under my feet and went through the glass front door of my elementary school. And so Chaz and I looked at each other and we looked at the skateboard, ripped it out of the glass, jumped out of the three-wheeler, took off, and we never talked about it again. It was as if that day had never happened. But it happened at junior high. And that thing, that broken window, just ate at me. It ate at me and ate at me and ate at me. And then I became a college student at Michigan State. I remember sitting in a campus ministry meeting, singing worship songs, praying and thinking about that broken window. I was convicted. Not that yet. Choo, choo, choo. Go back away. I was convicted. Okay? In my 20s, I visited my friend John down in Florida, and, and he was a Christian friend of mine, and he wanted to hang out, and so I happened to be down in Florida, so he's like, let's hang out. So we went to a, a coffee shop to hang out in this trendy area, and we, we grabbed coffee, and we were sitting there talking about Jesus and our faith and all that sort of thing. Um, and so a lot of our, 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 relate, our conversation was just centered around the Lord and around the gospel, but it was summer in Florida, and a lot of the young women that were coming in the coffee shop were dressed accordingly to summer in Florida, and I could not keep my eyes from just bouncing around the room, and I was constantly distracted. And my friend John didn't say anything about it to me, but a, a couple weeks after that, he wrote me an email. And, and the email basically said, you know, you were unable to do clearly in that meeting what Job said he did in his writings in the Old Testament where he said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully after a woman. And, and, and he just reproved me in this, this, this letter. Uh, and, and I was confronted about my sin. Now, here's the key moment. When we have sinned and we become aware of the sin, we're either convicted, the Holy Spirit is doing something inside of us, or we're confronted by the sin. Someone comes to us and says, hey, this is the sin that I see in your life. This is the crucial moment. Because in this crucial moment, we are going to face grief. Because it doesn't matter whether you, you are, are, are when, you, when you're caught in your sin or you're convicted of your sin, you're going to start to feel this grief inside you about your sin. And the big question at that moment is, is this go grief going to be godly grief or is this going to be worldly grief? Remember what Paul said? Let me read it again. He said, for godly grief produces Repentance. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief leads to death. Think about that. These are the two potential outcomes of our grief salvation or death. 
Now, salvation, it's key here. He's, he says, doesn't, doesn't just say salvation. He says salvation without regret. In other words, he's saying that they, they, you don't have to live and die with regret. He's trying to push them toward a truth. The truth that we see in 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? So that's what comes from repentance. And what he's saying is, it's possible to have salvation with all sorts of regret. To live in salvation, to be saved, and yet not to live inside of our salvation. To be eternally secure with our names written in the book of life, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and yet to live a life of regret and death. There's a woman named Gretchen uh, Ronovic. She wrote a book on parenting. And this is how she confronts her kids about their sin, but I think it applies. He, she said, I'm not pointing out what you did was wrong because I hate you. I am pointing out what you did was wrong so that you can understand the depths of how much I love you. What you did won't shake my love, and I love you too much to let you keep doing it. This is why we get convicted or confronted by sin, because the Holy Spirit loves us, because God loves us, because our friends love us, and they love us too much for us to keep doing it. It doesn't shake the love, but it just is challenging us. And so that's what God does for us, and the choice then becomes ours. We have a path toward death or salvation without regret. And the path to salvation, check this out, is repentance. Let's put the chart back up again. And the word for repentance is the word in Greek, metanoia. That word literally is from two words. Meta means change. Noia means how you think. See, sometimes we just think repentance is I'm just gonna do something different. Now, just doing something different without thinking differently about the thing is not repentance. Repentance is metanoia. It is changing your perspective. It's having a change in your mind. And this is where I think people go off the rails on this all the time. They think that grief itself is repentance. Feeling sad about getting caught is repentance. Feeling really terrible about their sin is repentance. But it's not. They think the consequences of their sin and the fact that they have to face that is repentance, but it's not. Repentance is changing the way you think about your sin. It's not just being sad about your sin or getting, or getting caught or not wanting to face consequences. It's a wholesale change in attitude toward that sin that causes you to turn away and do something different, right? So it's not the turning away to do something different. That's not the repentance. It's the changing of your mind that causes you to turn away to get things right. So when I was sitting there in, in the campus ministry at Michigan State, singing worship songs, thinking about the, this stupid broken window, I, I, I was convicted that I, I sh A, I shouldn't have broken the window, and B, I should have done something about it. I shouldn't have just left it broken there. I, I should have at least talked to Charlie about it. So I didn't, I didn't know what to do. So as a college student, this is how I decided to solve that problem. I wrote my elementary school letter, and this we're talking about years and years and years later, and I included like a $50 check or something. I, I don't remember how much it was. It was like 50, I think. It was a lot of money in 1991, at least in my brain. That should have covered the window. I, and I don't know what they thought of the letter, but I do know they cashed the check. <laughs> and my conscience was finally clear. No regret. So what does the path to death look like? Well, Paul doesn't explicitly say. So just like he says godly grief leads to repentance, metanoia, that leads to salvation. He, he says worldly grief leads to death, but there's gotta be an intermediate step, right? Well, that intermediate step is the opposite of re repentance. And what's the opposite of a change in your mind? I'm gonna call it hard-heartedness. It's when we refuse to change our mind about the thing, about the sin in our life. It's digging your heels in, it's hiding, it's blaming, it's keeping on sinning. The, the main difference between godly grief and worldly grief is our orientation. Godly grief is all oriented toward Jesus and worldly grief is all self-oriented. 
Because godly grief turns around and follows Jesus, and, and worldly grief just sticks with who we are. It operates on pity and fear and shame and humiliation. It's about saving face. When I got John's email, I was super embarrassed. I mean, we were supposed to be having this conversation about Jesus. And so I wrote him an email back that was like a half apology, even though he wasn't the one that really needed the apology. It was filled with excuses about the fact that it was winter and I live in Michigan and in Florida. You know, it's the whole thing. Everyone's covered up in Michigan. We wear snowsuits the whole year. Just the, just, it was like that sort of thing. And, I'm, and that, that was my, my response to him. And I was defensive, and even in my apologizing, I dug my heels in, and I blamed the weather, and I blamed the girls, and there was no change in my attitude toward my son. That's why Paul describes this as salvation without regret. It's not that we don't regret our sins over here. It's just that over here, they continue to exercise power over us because we don't change the way we think about them. Over here, we've changed our mind about our sins. They no longer exercise power over us because we've changed our mind about them. And that's the thing. You can tell which path you're on by what's happening in the middle. And Paul kind of gets at this in a sort of obscure way when he says he was comforted by God through Titus. Look at this in verse seven. He says not only by, he was comforted not only by the arrival of Titus, but also by the comfort he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorrow, and your zeal for me so that I rejoiced even more. And so Paul is basically saying, this is the evidence that there was repentance in your life. And this is why he had joy. He had joy that was overflowing because of their repentance. And he saw their repentance in how they responded to his severe letter, and it comforted him. What does he say? He said, well, they had deep longing and, and sorrow, and their zeal was for him. Well, what does that mean? It feels really weird, right, Paul? But no, th this is the kicker. Paul was the guy who was sinned against. He was the guy that had been sinned against by these people creating divisions in the church and the one guy that was kind of after him. So what he's basically saying is when they were confronted about their sin, they didn't get defensive in their grief. They weren't like backed into a corner in their grief. They didn't like go on the attack against Paul. It wasn't about them at all. Their zeal was not for themselves, but their zeal was for Paul. And so all this comfort that he received from them, all the zeal, the longing, the sorrow, all of that was oriented toward Paul who was the offended party. Sometimes it's not so easy to decipher what path you're on because sometimes it looks the same. Sometimes you can have sorrow and deep longing, but that sorrow and that deep longing is focused on yourself versus the offended party or Jesus. I know two men who faced almost exactly the same experience as one another. They were both in ministry, and while they were in ministry, they both hit on women who were not their wives. Both of these women two different situations, two different churches, reported these men to their churches, to the elders of those churches. And both of them were fired. Both of them went on and got counseling. Both of them had their marriages restored. And from the outside, you could look at these, these two men in their paths, and it seemed to be the same, because sometimes worldly grief and godly grief looks exactly the same. And so both of these men faced what appeared to be the same, and, and, and the outcome was different. One of them went on to flourish, and his marriage and his family and his life flourished. And the other friend of mine he took his own life. And honestly, you wouldn't have been able to tell from the outside what was going on. And, and, and I'm not sure that the one guy was completely godly in his r grief, and I'm not sure the other guy was completely worldly in his grief, because let's just be honest, it's not a straight line, isn't it? It's more like this most of the time, right? 
where we are just like all over the place. This is what repentance looks like in our life. And you're not gonna get it 100% right. You're not gonna have a 100% clean line. And I believe both of these men went through this and worked their way around both of these. A few weeks ago on Easter, uh, there's a picture embedded in the narrative of Easter of this very thing. You see, when Jesus was sitting in the upper room on the night he was betrayed, he basically told the guys that he was hanging out with, one of you is gonna betray me. And then he pointed out the guy who was gonna betray him. It's Judas. He's like, you're, you're the one. You're gonna betray me. And Judas kind of takes off to go betray him. And then he continues this conversation. He says, you know, you're all gonna abandon me. All of you are leaving me, every one of you. And Peter's like, not me. Never doing it. And Jesus, like, it's that famous thing where Jesus says, yeah, yeah, you are. You're gonna do it three times tonight before the rooster, rooster crows tomorrow morning. You're not even gonna get like 12 hours out of this deal. Peter, Peter's like, okay, well, we'll just see, right? We'll just see how that goes. And you guys all know the story if you've been around the church. Judas goes on to betray Jesus. Peter goes on to deny him three times. Both of these men commit heinous sins against Jesus. They both were grieved for their sins, and there's a sense in which both of them seemed to change their ways. It looked that way from the outside, but they had different outcomes. Let me read the accounts. Matthew 27. It says this, Matthew 27. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was full of remorse. That's grief and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I've sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us, they said. See to it yourself. So he threw the silver into the temple, and he departed, and then he went and he hanged himself. It is fairly universally understood that Judas did not repent. There's some theological debate about that. What we do know is that he was consumed with worldly grief not godly grief. It took over him, and he ended his own life. Peter, on the other hand, after he found out about Jesus returning from the dead, but before he saw Jesus face to face, because remember, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again on the third day as we celebrate on Easter, and Peter heard about this, but he hadn't seen Jesus yet, so what Peter did is he went to his safe place, and like most men, his safe place was fishing. So, right, so he goes fishing. He's just got to process this whole thing, right? So he's out there. He hears about Jesus coming back from the dead, doesn't know what to do. He's fishing. John 21, when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? Which is like the meanest thing you can say to somebody who's fishing. But Jesus didn't sin in his meanness. You just think that because you're Midwestern. No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. And the disciple, the one Jesus loved, which, by the way, is how John refers to himself. He's the guy who wrote it. Um, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. He didn't even take the boat back. He jumped into the water and just started swimming to Jesus. And that's where this whole thing takes a beautiful turn because Jesus on the beach cooks them all breakfast. And when he's cooking them breakfast, he, he says to Peter as they're chewing on their fish, he's like, hey, Peter, do you love me more than all these guys? <laughs> and Peter's like, of course I do. You know I do. And then he's like, then feed my sheep. And then Jesus, a second time, asked the same question. Do you love me more than all these dudes? And Peter's like, dude, yes. This is the old translation. <laughs> and, and he got the same spot. He, he said, Jesus, of course I do. And Jesus said, then, then, then shepherd my sheep. And then for a third time, Jesus asks him this question. This is what it says. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. <laughs> what a great response, isn't it? You know everything. You know what's going on in my heart. You know what's going on in my head. You know that I love you more than anybody. <laughs> 
You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. The, the beauty of this is, 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 is so deep. I want you to grasp it. Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus forgave him three times. And he handed him a ministry that Peter could perform without regret. It makes you wonder what would have happened to Judas if he'd repented. Remember earlier I mentioned the difference between godly and worldly sorrow was orientation? <laughs> Let's put up that graphic again. They both start in the same place, grief. But before the grief comes our sin. For many of us, we've never even taken the leap from sin to grief. We've just been happy to just kind of live our lives however we want to live our lives, no matter how it affects anybody else around us, and we just happily live here. But there will come a point in your life, it'll happen, or you're gonna be convicted about that sin, or you're gonna be confronted about it, and you're, you're gonna grieve. And then the question is, what are you gonna do with that? We have to sit with this. We have to sit sometimes with the grief that comes from sin. James, who's Jesus' half-brother, said it this way. In James 4, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. <laughs> Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, sometimes we have to sit with the hard stuff. We sometimes want to jump right to the joy, this overwhelming joy that flowed out of Paul. We want to get to that point. We want to go to the comfort that we know that God presents to us, that he, he declared right there that Titus had brought him this comfort. But we don't want to sit with the grief of our sin. But drawing near to God means taking a hard look at our sin and being honest about it, beginning to think differently about our sin, thinking how he think, Jesus thinks about our sin. It's called repentance. Our sin, in a sense, should wreck us. Eventually, years after John emailed me, and I emailed him back, I was still haunted. I was haunted by the interaction that I had with John, and slowly, the Holy Spirit had done enough work inside me that I changed the way I thought about that whole interaction down in Florida. So I called John. <laughs> this is years later. And I thanked him for his confrontation of my sin. And we talked through steps I could take and steps I needed to take to follow after Jesus in that area of my life. And I bet you are a lot like me. I bet you've had some sin in your life that has caused you some grief, and sometimes you've responded well <laughs> with godly grief. And sometimes you haven't. You dug your heels in, you, you hardened your heart, and you said, no, there's this area of my life, this sin that I have, I like it too much. I, I, it's like my pet sin. Like, I, I, I just want this sin in my life. And so I, I don't want to deal with this one. And, and, and I know that this is a really uncomfortable message, but like I said, sometimes we have to sit and grieve for a little while. James said, sometimes we need to be miserable for a little while. And I know this has been an uncomfortable message and I'm gonna make it a little more uncomfortable. What we're gonna do is we're gonna sit and think about our sin for a second. And maybe you've never even done that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna sing a song that's very familiar around here and you're welcome to sing it. You're also welcome not to sing it. But I want you just to stay seated. I want you to think about your own life. Think about your sin and allow it to grieve you a little bit. Thank you. 
Let's not forget where this message started. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, I am very frank with you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overflowing with joy in our afflictions. For even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. And if I grieved you since, if I regret it, since I saw the letter grieved you, yet only for a while, I now rejoice. Not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God wills. So that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. Paul was overjoyed because of the fact that no matter how deep the Corinthians' sin was, Jesus' love was deeper. That even if they had been unfaithful, Jesus was faithful. That he is the only one that is ever truly faithful. And so when we place our faith in him, when we repent of our sins, we think differently about our sins, he gives us his faithfulness and his righteousness. And so we can celebrate that even if we start with grief, that path uh, of repentance leads to salvation. So we can declare along with Paul in Romans 8, for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for that sin, even that sin that deeply grieves you, which means that you can grieve your sin, but know that it has no power over you. You can grieve your sin, but be overflowing in joy for what Jesus has done for you on the cross. And so if you have never placed your faith in Jesus, I wanna encourage you to make today the day. 
because you can't do it. Your sin will beat you down. It will be the thing that will be the end of you. It will wreck you. It will take you to death. That's what sin does. But changing your mind about how you think about your sin, turning around and following Jesus is a path to salvation and a life without regret. There are no dark corners in your life where you can run away from Jesus, which means there's no dark corners in your life where his grace and forgiveness cannot reach. And so if you are in Jesus, you are set free from your sin. So this is what we're gonna do to wrap up today. We're gonna do something a little bit weird. The next song that we're gonna sing is, is a song that we normally think is about grief and sorrow in the moments of loss but it's a song that as we sing it can be applied to the grief and sorrow that we have for our sin, even our godly grief. So I'm gonna encourage you to stand up and then I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing one more song and it may seem like a sorrowful song but it's a song that is grief that can lead to joy. Let's, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his, his work on the cross. We thank you that our salvation is not based on anything that we do, but on what Jesus has already done. And so we just pray that yes, we would grieve our sins. And yes, I just pray that we would grieve them deeply, that, that our, our sins should wreck us. But I just pray that, that because of Jesus, that we can have hope and that through repentance, that we can have salvation without regret. And so I just pray that we battle and wrestle with and lean into those dueling emotions here this morning. And we just pray all of this in the name of the only one who saves Jesus. We pray in his name, amen.
know about you guys, but I often, when convicted or confronted with my sin, I get stuck in that grief part, and I beat myself up for a long time, and the words of that song are just so powerful to me. Uh, My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for Jesus. Thank you for him, for sending him to rescue me, um, to take away my guilt and my shame, Lord, and that he died so that my sins could be paid for. And thank you for the hope that that gives me, Lord, that my soul can be well um, and that I can go out with joy um, because I know I am in you, in Christ. Um, And I just pray, Lord, that you would continue to work this week in our lives. Help us to deal with our sin and help us to move toward that godly grief and the repentance that leads to salvation, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your week.